Good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Worldwide Neuro Theory Forum today with Paul Miller. Uh, before I introduce Paul, uh, as you know by now, we uh, have a ask a question function down at the bottom of your screen, and you can also uh, shoot banter to the right. Um, also, apologies for the somewhat erratic scheduling changes in the last few weeks, um, but we're very happy to have Paul here today. Um, Paul got his PhD in physics in 1995 uh, in Bristol, and then originally wanted to become a teacher and went to Malawi actually to teach uh, high school students and was lured back uh, to a postdoc at Georgetown University uh, where he um, did another physics postdoc uh, from 1997 to 2000. Um, after 2000, he finally decided that physics wasn't it, but this time uh, he came to Brandeis University and started a postdoc with Chao Jing Wang uh, in computational neuroscience. Uh, he stayed at Brandeis even after Xiao Jing Wang himself had left. And in fact, he filled the shoes of both uh, Larry Abbott and Xiao Jing Wang, who, who both unfortunately left Brandeis during, uh, during Paul's tenure, or maybe fortunate for Paul because uh, his tenure there became a lifelong tenure and he's now an associate professor for computational neuroscience. Uh, he is also uh, the author of a, a very lovely computational neuroscience book uh, which I would urge you to look up if you're in the business of teaching computational neuroscience uh, because it's uh, the third or maybe the first uh, in uh, the list of computational neuroscience books uh, other than the Diane and Avid and the um, um, Gerstner book that gives a really lovely oversight and uh, introduction to computational neuroscience. But um, today Paul is here to talk about homeostasis. So Paul, uh, without any other comments, the floor or the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Tim. Let me share the screen. <clears throat> I should say that um, the lure to Georgetown. Go on. Let me just play. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so, so when I was lured to America, I'd say it was more by my fiance, my American fiance at the time, than by physics itself, but it all worked out. Um, Okay, so, so today I'm going to talk to you about a story where a lot of the work was done by a great postdoc who's worked with me, Jonathan Cannon. He's um, now um, a, a postdoc still at MIT, and this is work at Brandeis University. And we're going to be looking at homeostasis and a particular type and um, firing rate homeostasis in neurons, and basically how two different mechanisms can work better than one, um, and really in some ways this is surprising and it's a, a unique situation. Let me just change my pointer back. Um, and I, I ask you, is, you know, if you have any questions, Tim will be monitoring the, um, the questions and we'll bring any up, um, especially if anything is not clear as I go along, please, please let me know. Okay, so um, this is just a brief outline. I'm just gonna talk about what homeostasis is in neurons and homeostasis in general just means a return to a, a set level. Um, it's kind of a, you can think of it as a kind of restoring force, force in air quotes, where um, when it's the firing rate of neurons that they have an ideal firing rate. And if over a long period they deviate from it, there's a return to that ideal level. Um, we're going to look at the stability problem, um, re really, which arises when you have more than one homeostatic mechanism, how it can be solved with certain constraints. Then, um, you know, given two mechanisms are harder, you know, are there any benefits? And the last 15 minutes or so, we'll be looking at you know, any hallmarks as far as you know, everything in biology, you know, the, these sorts of feedback are going to be done through intracellular mechanisms. And you know, are there any ways of distinguishing you know, where the control is and so on? So if we look at homeostasis in neurons, um, I'm just going to begin by showing you know, just you know, some, th this is a um, fairly recent um, recordings. This is optical imaging from the Harris and Carandini lab. And this is just spontaneous activity in visual cortex. And really I'm just highlighting that one thing that we all know that in vivo neural activity is variable. Um, so this makes, makes homeostasis in neurons very different from the classic types of homeostasis. 
if you think about body temperature or you know certain salinities or pHs, that you know we wouldn't want concentrations of ions you know varying by the amount the neural firing rates vary. And in fact, neural firing rates have to vary because it's only when they vary they're com conveying information. You know, we we couldn't have a newspaper where the the um, tone was uniformly gray rather than you know the mixtures on black and white. So it's this variability that and here each dot essentially being a spike, that you can see your minutes of very high firing rate, minutes of very low. And, and here, this is, although this is visual cortex, it's linked to motor behavior. And you can imagine, you know, in other areas where neural responses are even more specific, that this variability could be even, you know, you could have even la larger periods of time without any firing. And if, if you have cells which are really responding to specific input, they might be responding at high rates for you know, just maybe a few seconds over an hour is in principle possible. And um, of course, it's hard to find those and measure them. So given that there's variability, um, you might think that the homeostasis required is a little different because for a neuron, if you think of a neuron responding to inputs and through much of the talk, we're just going to use a simple firing rate model. We also get, you know, the same results I'll show from spiking and exponential integrated and fire models. But if you think of there being a threshold, which kind of is setting the um, position on the x-axis of the firing rate curve. And then when you get inputs, they come through excitatory synapses, we'll just think about for now with a gain, um, or I mean, I guess with it, if it's inhibitory, which is basically scaling multiplicati multiplicatively the um, firing rates of presynaptic cells, so that each time there's a presynaptic spike, you have um, an EPSP proportional to this conductance. So you have these two parameters which can be scaled. And together, they kind of set the range of the firing rate responses. So you can think of the threshold kind of setting the mean and the input conductance setting how variable your firing rate is going to be in response to inputs. So, you know, we have the two parameters, is the threshold and the scaling of the input conductance. And when you have a range of firing rates you might want, then you, you actually have two parameters as well. You, have, you, know, you can think of it as the minimum and the maximum, or we're going to look at the mean and the variance, for example. So you might think then that two mechanisms might be good in this sort of situation when you want a lot of variation in the response. And indeed, you know, over 20 years ago now, um, in the Trigiano lab at Brandeis, they did experiments where monocular deprivation basically means putting a patch over one eye and you know this isn't this was like the first experiments they've done a lot more with a lot more um, detail using TTX to really silent cells and um, so the eye patch you keep spontaneous activity but it certainly reduces the firing of retinal neurons and then also v1 neurons so when they look at neurons in v1 primary visual cortex what they notice after a few days of reduced input the mean and um, excitatory conductance increases significantly and so here is about a 30 percent increase at the same time though in the exactly the same sort of experiment they see if you um, just inject current into the cells um the, and this is taking slices now from the hemispheres of these um these were mice molecularly monocularly um, deprived that again after several days their responsiveness shifts so you can think of this as you know, a horizontal shift in the firing rate curve so that that threshold is decreased. So what that means is for each cell, each time there's a presynaptic spike, the excitatory conductance is higher, so more current will go into the cell, but also for a given amount of current entering the cell, the more likely it is to fire a spike. Okay, so these open triangles are the response after this um, reduced input. Um, so we're gonna think of this then as a multiplicative change in response to presynaptic cells. You know, one spike, you know, each each time there's a presynaptic spike, there's a certain percentage change in the postsynaptic current. And this is a kind of horizontal shift or a subtraction in the threshold. So, and just kind of schematically in the cartoon in their paper, they show, show these two types of change. Um, and we're kind of focusing on, you know, the excitatory synapse is increasing. Um, and I'm going to be using a color code, so you know, through much of the talk, this is going to be in red, the um, change in input gain or excitatory conductance. Um, also, you get you know, a combination, both of these have now actually been observed, that there's an increase in the number of sodium channels and a decrease in the number of potassium channels, which will be reducing the spike threshold, so you're, you're going to fire spikes more easily. 
So homeostasis in general is looked at through control theory. And, you know, and this is you know, a major field. You know, every undergraduate engineer learns this. Um, you know, it's, less com it's less well known in biology. And I, and I always think that it, you know, having more engineers in biology would be very valuable. Um, you know, we're, we're really, really all living things are dyna dynamical systems and they need to be controlled. So, so it's important to understand these things. So the idea of control theory is that you have some sort of target. So in this case, for the neuron, there'll be a target firing rate. And you're, that's being compared with the output of the neuron, which is the out, neuron's actual firing rate. And then, you know, there could be a function over the two, but essentially there's an error, which is only zero if the output rate matches the target. Okay. Then you have some feedback, which depends on the error in some way. If, if you know a bit of control theory, you know it could be you know, derivative, proportional, or integral. In this case, integral control is really the best for homeostasis. So you have a feedback signal, which is integrating up the error signal. And typically, this would be a plus here. But in this case, and because we, we're using the input gain as a multiplication. But the idea here, if you see the firing rate, if the firing rate is low here, too low compared to the target, the error will be positive if these are positive monotonic functions. Then the positive error will come in. It will increase G, the um, input conductance and then the impact of external input will be greater so you'll get more current coming in and the firing rate again this is a positive monotonic function will go up so there's really just one requirement in this system i mean you have to worry about time constants but there's a clear stability requirement that you know if the firing rate is too low the feedback had better increase it if the firing rate is too high the feedback had better decrease it and this is just you know just how thermostats work you know if you're room gets too hot, that's when you want to put the air conditioner on. You don't want the air conditioning to go on when it's way too cold and vice versa. So, you know, high temperatures, we cool the house, low temperatures, we heat it. And you want the same type of response here to set the firing rate. However, when there are two types of feedback, we have a different situation. And one, one thing to consider, and really, um, I should have cited his, I cited him later, Tim O'Leary has done work looking at this type of controller, where you have the same type of target and error signal, but now after the controller, and it's key that it's after the controller, which integrates the error signal, we now get a branching to two feedback mechanisms. One would be the excitatory conductance that we saw before, and one would be feedback that impacts the threshold. Um, here the threshold, and, and this is something throughout this talk, that if you want to make the neuron fire more, you increase the input conductance, but you decrease the threshold. So one has to come in with a negative sign. You could think of this then as um, sodium channels rather than potassium channels, for example. Um, would in, you know, if you increase sodium conductance, that would decrease the threshold. So these together come, you know, combine and will impact the firing rate. One thing you'll notice in this system that both the feedback on the input conductance and the feedback on the threshold are proportional to the output of the controller. So this will give rise to correlations in any variation. Um, and, you might, and this is something that is actually observed in vivo, um, not as a function of synaptic inputs, but as a function of different types of intrinsic cha um, channel concentrations, you will find some correlations which are very likely reduced to them coming from the same type of feedback mechanism. But the ones observed to date, you can all think of belonging to the same threshold mechanism. And Tim O'Leary did some great work um, showing how that arises. <clears throat> the other mechanism which I've been looking at is the idea that instead of one controller, you have two. So although this looks really complicated, all I've done is done a mirror image loop at the top. So the bottom loop is that original one with feedback control for the conductance. But the idea is then, what if you had a second controller? And the problem with the second controller, it means you're integrating up a different error signal. Okay. And the key with how these systems work and why integral feedback control works, if you want to look at, say, what is the fixed point of the system where the firing rate never changes, where well, you can look at all the things changing, and here you see something which has got an integral over time. So the rate of change of this is just proportional to the error. Okay? If the rate of change is proportional to the error, the only way you get zero rate of change is if there's zero error. So this controller has to satisfy this error one being zero, whereas you have a controller here which is only satisfied by error two being zero, okay? So this is why having more than one controller seems like a crazy thing because you have two targets. And we'll, we'll look at 
little more of the problem of this in a minute. Um, and then having two targets basically leads to a stability problem. And if we look at it in equations, if we just have a simple firing rate model of the cell, that the firing rate is going to be um, depending on something proportional to the inputs. Um, here I is really input rather than current because it's multiplied by the conductance. And T is a threshold. Then together we have homeostatic feedback. One is changing G, one is changing T. And they're satisfied by these different equations, which depend on separate errors. Then we get two, each equation has a fixed point on its own, but the fixed points depend on separate goal rates if there are separate control mechanisms. So this is really what I was saying before. We have a fixed point when R is the goal for the um, synaptic feedback in one case, a fixed point when R is the goal for the threshold feedback. And if we look at this in phase space, you know, if we plot as a function of G and D, T, how DG, DT, and DT, DT, which is hard to say, how they vary, we get a phase portrait like this. And in particular, you get something called wind-up, where in this case, if one goal is higher than the other, we're trying to increase the conductance to raise the firing rate, while at the same time trying to um, increase the threshold to reduce the firing rate, but sitting at a firing rate in between the two. And this would be a terrible situation, which is why you might consider it a bad idea. And this would be, you know, if you imagine a room with two separate thermostats, one controlling the heating, one controlling the air conditioning, and if, if they're set so that the um, air conditioning is, say, go down to 70, and the heating is saying go up to 75, you'd be at 72. I should use Celsius, maybe 15 and 20, and you're set at 17 Celsius and the heating is cranking up as much as they can on maximum. And similarly, the air conditioning is cranking up. So here you'd just be producing more and more channels which are really competing with each other and not helping. But it's worth noting that this is all assuming static inputs so that there is actually a fixed point of the system. And what we, if you think about realistic um, you know, neurons and the properties of firing rates as I showed them being variable, variable we realize that there are two constraints that can actually help solve the stability problem. And these are constraints that are actually present in nature. So first of all, if the signal, you know, the inputs to any neuron and its responses are fluctuating rapidly um, compared to the time scale of homeostasis, but um, you know, it has to be a little bit slow compared to the feedback. Otherwise the feedback just averages over the fluctuations. Then essentially what you're doing with the homeostasis is you're, is you're responding to a distribution of firing rates. So if the feedback were linear, you'd be just um, you know, controlling the mean of that distribution. But it, when the feedback is nonlinear, then there'll be various moments of a distribution that are under control from the feedback. And, and it's worth noticing with neurons that even when you do have fixed firing rate, you know, the physical variables, the voltage is clearly going up and down to produce spikes. And calcium, as we know, is, you know go, goes up and down when there's a spike. So these are fluctuating quantities anyway. So you're, not actually, you're never controlling a static quantity the way you would be with body temperature. You know, we're, if our body temperature is varied up by the same proportion that calcium in cells does, we'd all be dead. You know, we, we couldn't go up to um, 50 Celsius and down to 20 Celsius for our body temperature and survive. Although I believe some animals can, but maybe not that quickly. Um, so the, the other aspect is that if the control mechanisms are nonlinear functions, if they were all linear, they'd all both be controlling the mean, and then it would only work if they have this, you know, trying to produce the same mean response. But if they're nonlinear functions, and in particular different nonlinear functions, then it may be possible to satisfy both controllers. And this is almost bound to be true because any biochemical signaling pathway is going to respond nonlinearly to its activations in different manners. And the chances of two signaling pathways having exactly the same nonlinear response is, is kind of pretty much minimal. So just to give some intuition, um, oh, first I'll just show this in equations, that I'm just putting that in these parentheses to show kind of the mean. And this is a mean as a function of time, whereas you can think over time that you're hitting a distribution of firing rates. And it's that distribution that's being controlled. But it's the mean of some function of the firing rate. So to give some intuition, the two simplest functions we can think of is if one were linear and one were quadratic. And Joachim Trish actually looked at this in some beautiful work um, several years, many years, about a decade before we did in a, a nice neural computation paper. So it turns out if you do this, you have to set the synaptic feedback to be the quadratic function. 
the threshold, the linear one. But now you can see if we do this, then the feedback control is controlling, in one case, the mean square of the firing rates, the other, the mean of the firing rates. And when you have such a situation, you can see then that the threshold, if it's controlling the mean firing rate, it has to be, at the, the mean would have to be at the fixed point of the threshold function. Um, but the variance of the firing rate is now set by essentially the difference between these goals squared. Okay, so, so we, as we know, any variance from the triangle inequality has to be positive. Also, firing rates have to be positive. So this actually puts a restriction that, you know, you can only get a decent fixed point if RG here, the goal for the synaptic response, is greater than the threshold response. Um, otherwise, you basically could only satisfy this with negative firing rates, which, which silence the system. Um, we also found another, you know, another requirement for fixed point is that in this case, it's the second derivative. And, and this is kind of more general. If, if you're dealing with quadratic and linear, then clearly this, the quadratic one, the second derivative is greater than the linear one. Um, <clears throat> but it has to be the second derivative of the synaptic feedback that is greater. And this, if you think about it, is basically if you need to increase the variance in the response because the variance is too low, you better have the two feedbacks ordered this way so that it is the, um, the goal rate of the synaptic feedback that is higher, that as you then increase the firing rate, you'll be um, getting closer to satisfy this one. Um, if, you, if you switch these around and made the mean one the RG, you, you'd be trying to use shifts in the threshold to increase the variance, um, which in our situation isn't helping. So whichever is basically producing greater nonlinearity in the feedback, that has to be the one with the higher goal um, and be the one that has higher second derivative in its feedback. So if we put these into a system, um, which I, I'll do in a little bit later, but first I'll just show you why you might want to do that in the system. So I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. But if we, if we look at a firing rate model, and you know, at first it's just a cartoon, um, although it is a simulated cartoon, so I guess it brings a new, new meaning to cartoon, I guess, when you're doing computation, where we have a firing rate model, and we're just going to go through a few layers where the input to one layer depends on the output of the previous layer, and there's a gain and a threshold. And we're just going to send a sine wave stimulus through, and we're going to look at a range of thresholds and a range of input conductances. And in this situation, if things are just aligned perfectly so that as the, the firing rate, and here we've just normalized so that the rate's zero to one is minimum to maximum, that basically if the range of a presynaptic cell um, or, or a group of presynaptic cells going into a neuron match the range of its outputs so that a zero to one in the inputs matches a zero to one in the outputs, then you can get great transmission of you know, original inputs down through several layers. And, you know, in classic um, homeostasis and feedback control, we know that if the threshold is too high, less and less firing gets through the successive layers and eventually the output's quiescent. Alternatively, if the threshold is too low, then the neuron responds higher and you get more and more output. And in any of these cases, after a few, you know, few layers through um, and these are layers in the neural network sense. I don't, don't necessarily mean cortical layers, but going through a few connections in a neural circuit, you basically lost all information about the input. Similarly, we can look at changing conductance where the mean is kept um, correct by the threshold. And in this case, if the conductance is too low, going from one layer to another, um, for a given range of firing rates of the input, you get a reduced range of the outputs. And in this case, then the signal disappears. So having you know, too lower conductance is bad. Having too higher conductance is not too bad, but what is happening is essentially um, a small increase is giving an you know, acceler accentuated increase in the next layer to eventually you get minimum and maximum rates. You basically end up with binary responses. Um, so you've lost the gradation, in the information about the gradation of the stimulus here. And you know, we can look at all these combinations as well and you get different types of behavior um, and the idea now is that, you know, if you have one spot in 2D space that is perfect, you might want to be able to control both these variables or parameters, I should say, independently to reach that spot. If you just have one control mechanism, you might be coupling them, but you might be going along a direction, which is non-ideal, like along, a line along here 
if you had an output that couples the threshold and the, and the input conductance, then you may never hit the sweet spot. So we're kind of going to quantify this by looking at mutual information, where the signal now is um, every 500 milliseconds, we give it a different level. And we're seeing how the output rate um, gives information about the input level. And we're sending it through exactly the same type of neuron with some noise. And we're going to look at different levels of conductance and threshold. Okay, so the conductance is scaling the signal to say, in this case, how much current is going into the cell. And then the threshold determines the firing rate of the cell in response. Okay, and when things are good, you've, we're basically following the range of the inputs. If the conductance is too low, even if we raise the threshold so that the mean rate might be high enough, um, you see that very little of the input is getting through, essentially because there's minimal current. If we do high input, then you know, if the threshold is low, then even though the input current has a lot all the information about the stimulus, um, the firing rate is saturating and there's very little response. And the final, you know, the, the one that is almost okay is if you have high conductance and high threshold, you lose the fine gradation that you see, you know, in the stimulus and the input current, but um, there is some information. If we just plot then, after calculating the mutual information, what we see in 2D, if we plot the threshold on the x-axis, the input conductance on the y-axis, clearly if the input is too low, you get no information, and you get these ranges where there's nothing. But there is a definite, you know, there's a definite maximum here, and A, point A is near the maximum. And certainly if you're far away, you get much worse mutual information. Um, and it's very easy to be off on the left or on the right. Um, but th this region up here where you both have high threshold and high conductance is kind of where you're producing binary responses. So the information doesn't degrade so poorly if you go off in that direction. Um, <clears throat> so we, we looked at this in a system where we actually have you know, produced spiking neurons rather than just a firing rate model. And in this case, we did an adaptive exponential integrated and fire. And here the ad adaptation was important because we're going to be looking at mutual information. So we didn't want the firing rates to be go able to go on forever. And so J Jonathan found this nice function where if we actually make the um, adaptation term impact the voltage in a cubic manner and have strong adaptation, then what you see when you look at the firing rate curve, we had, you know, this was kind of as ideal as we could get playing around with parameters where you have a pretty linear response to input and then it saturates at a certain rate. Um, so again, when you do this, if the input, if the range of the inputs is kind of matching the range of the responses of the cell in terms of spikes per second, and we do the same, we we give inputs that are constant for 500 milliseconds at a time, um, and then look at the firing rate and see how well the firing rate gives information about the inputs. And in this case, we're counting spikes in the cell. So there's some. This is why you get the small discretization. Again, when you look at the mutual information, you know, there is a particular maximum. But now what we're going to do is see, can the system find the maximum using those types of feedback control like I showed before. So, for example, we start from different initial conditions, you know, very high conductance, very high threshold, and so on. We find in all cases with the dual control mechanism that you will go to this, you know, sweet spot. Um, and, and the sweet spot is really determined by having high enough variance and, and a mean that's right in the middle of the range. There's a couple of indicators of a dual system which are interesting and of nice, and, and I'll, I'll just kind of point them out there. You notice some of these curves are non-monotonic. In this case, the threshold, when it's too high, goes down, but it overshoots and come back, comes back. Here, the conductance goes down and comes back. And this is common, you know, when you have a two-variable system, um, with interactions, then you can get these biphasic responses in here, either the input conductance or the threshold. And this one, it begins by going up and then coming down. So in these sorts of things are sometimes observed over days in, um, in experiments, but they're usually attributed to a new biochemical mechanism coming under, into play. But really when you have two processes, they can be competing and you can get these biphasic responses is in a, if you're measuring any one quantity. <clears throat> and this is just simply showing that two are better than one. If we only could only change threshold or only can change conductance and you start in one of these positions, 
you never get to the good mutual information. So, you know, the, the neuron is losing inf a lot of information in either of these cases. And this is quantified here where the blue is showing the dual mechanism, the red and yellow is showing, you know, a single one at a time. Um, and, and as I was kind of pointing out, if you kind of couple the mechanism, so we did change threshold and conductance, you would just be moving in a straight line somewhere like this. You would never get to this, you know, optimal position. And we can also, in this case, show if we change to if we change the input. So, um, if, for example, we have a system with a very low range of inputs, where there the optimal input conductance is pretty high, now we multiply up, I think, by a factor of ten the inputs. The ideal response is to reduce the input conductance by a factor of ten, and the dual mechanism will do this. So you can see that the threshold, you know, initially changes and then goes back but the conductance basically comes down tenfold. And if we look at the trajectory, um, these two graphs are different because these mutual information plots, you know, they're a, as a function of the threshold and the conductance, but they depend on the statistics of the inputs. So when you have different input statistics, we have a different maximum, a different optimal spot, and the system moves there. Um, you can change, you, know, you can just shift the inputs without scaling them so much. And in this case, it's the threshold that will dominate in its response. And you can also, okay, I guess I'm not showing this in this one. You can also do things like um, cut out inputs and do other changes. So the, the dual system is following, and here you see a really nice biphasic response in the conductance. It's first going up and then going down. <clears throat> so, um, you know, as, as I remember Eve Marder saying many years ago, neurons do a lot more, um, she really didn't like use of mutual information. And this was, I think, the first PhD of defense I attended at Brandeis because Neurons, of course, are doing a lot more than conveying information. Um, you wouldn't need a brain if all you had to do is convey inputs to outputs. So we, we looked at one calculation, and this is something I have some history with, um, the idea of tuning an integrator. And, and integrators are you know, observed um, in things like, or, or could be used in things like decision-making where you're integrating evidence. There are tasks, like um, in, the, in this case, it was keeping, maintaining eye fixation at different locations where you basically might need a neural activity to main, be maintained at a lot of different levels and change its level depending on input. So an integrator you know, is a really useful computational device. And the classic ways of doing it is you need feedback circuits. So in this case, although I'm doing a schematic with a firing rate model, we basically had a whole group of 100 of these exponential integrating fires with some very randomness in their feedback. Um, but now, again, the feedback and the threshold of each cell is going to be controlled by the same control mechanism. <clears throat> and to, just to show schematically a firing rate model what is going on with this sort of feedback integrator, again, we have input to each cell that is proportional to the firing rate of its in, in presynaptic inputs, which in this case, the presynaptic inputs are the same as the output rates. And the output rate is some function that depends on the threshold and those inputs. So what you might have if you have very strong feedback, for example, that, and here we actually have a pretty um, excitable cell, so that its firing rate, you know, even with zero input is pretty high. This would be a system where it goes to a very high firing rate because what you do is you look at the feedback. So if I look in red, the feedback current, and this is kind of one of these weird graphs where you're reading off the feedback current on the x-axis as a function of the firing rate on the y-axis. But it's nice because you can show where the standard FI curve, which is where the firing rate depends on the input current, when these two cross, it is telling you that at this point of firing rate, you're producing just enough feedback current to maintain that firing rate. Okay, and, and the system only has this one fixed win at a high firing rate. But to get to an integrator, what you need is, you know, in practice, it may be a lot of, with a lot of cells, a lot of closely spaced fixed points, or in a simple system, it would be really an overlapping of these lines so that the feedback response is overlapping with the firing rate response over a large range. And then in principle, you could be stable at a lot of different firing rates, or at least stable over a period of, enough of a period of time to do something useful. Um, and you know, where, this is kind of the output of the ideal system and how we're going to be testing it is that if we give different pulses of input, then the system can be stable at these very different firing rates, okay? And we produced a measure of, you know, ability to integrate based on how stable, how horizontal these lines were, and how 
you know, how equally spaced they were as we gave different inputs. And if you think of matching two curves or the linear portion of two curves as best you can, you've got the input output curve, which we can shift left and right by adjusting the threshold. Then the gain, which must go through the origin. So the feedback must go through the origin because when there's no firing rate, there's no feedback current. But, we, but the um, gain will be shifting the gradient of this. You know, all lines, Y equals MX plus C, have a gradient and an offset. If you can shift the offset and the gradient, then in principle, you can get them to match. So this is why I was thinking that, you know, two control mechanisms could help in this case. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out, when you have a single fixed point, firing rates are going to naturally tend towards that fixed point. <clears throat> and it actually ends up being this angle kind of tells you how rapidly and how tightly they are controlled at the fixed point. The integrator in this case is actually a case where the variance of firing rates tend to be maximal. It principally, they can just drift anywhere along the range. So there's you know, no tight control on them. So if we set our feedback controls so that you know, the two goal rates are set so the variance is high, we wanted to see if we could produce, reproduce you know, some sort of perfect behavior. And indeed we could. So this is again, if we look in the middle, this is when we have um, the, the phase plot where we're varying the threshold and the input conductance. And here in color is showing how good the integrator is. So this white dot is placed at the perfect integrator or as good an integrator as we can get, which is shown on the bottom left. So, you know, and we can then actually plot what is the final firing rate curve in blue and the feedback response in red. And it looks like this is a little offset, I guess. Um, so maybe we just offset the feedback instead of shifting the blue curve and the response to a series of pulses. So you can see when the system is working well, and it's a very narrow range, as you can see, then it does pretty well that each, each time there's a pulse is maintaining for many hundreds of milliseconds. And there's a clear difference, you know, in response to one pulse and five pulses. And what you can do then is just, you know, decrease the mean current to the system. And it responds by, responds by reducing the threshold, increase the mean response, it increases the threshold. And the other thing we did was just, you know, because the, we had 100 cells, we could just kill 20 of them. And so that's going to reduce the amount of input to every cell. So the ideal response there is to increase the synaptic conductance, and it does it. And each case, it returns to doing good integration. So here we've shown that, you know, this system can tune an integrator and do something useful. So in the final part of the talk, I wanted to look at your know, intracellular mechanisms and you know, is there any, how could we actually determine if this sort of dual control system is present and what would be going on? And because you know, in the Terigiano lab and elsewhere, they have been doing a number of experiments really over the last 20 years, trying to um, disentangle which um, proteins are at play and in what manner in all these different mechanisms. Um, and there are several of them they found now for feedback control. So if you recall the basic idea of the controller, um, of feedback control, you have an output with a target, there's an error signal. And re really what we're wanting to do is identify you know, different aspects of this system. So you know, we know the output is the firing rate and the target would be some goal rate. You know, what is the error signal? Well, it, may, it turns out that calcium is essential in all these feedback controls. So maybe that the calcium is not, you know, at a particular level that is desirable, and that would be an error. Then the key term here, though, is the controller. And we'll look at this a bit more, but the controller in the system is really an integrator. So is there any kind of biochemical mechanism that could be producing the integration? And then we know that, you know, by the time it's impacting the feedback, this plus is, you know, this is the adding, essentially it's always adding channels in the membrane, either amper receptors at the synapse or sodium potassium channels, you know, so this is that part of feedback. But it's really between where we detect firing rate via calcium to how we change the channels. You know, this, at some point there's a controller in there. And of course, things are much, much more complicated in biology. And this is going to be the simplified kind of scheme or cartoon of the biology that we're going to be modeling, that the spikes cause calcium entry. And pretty, and I'll, I'll say, so we're going to just simulate that simply as a function of um, firing rate or in response to each spike, calcium will go up as a delta function, decay exponentially. Then there's activation of kinase 4, 
which in the nucleus impacts transcription. Following transcription, you have mRNA, which must be transported, or, it, or there could be local translation, then transportation of proteins. Then you eventually need channels to be inserted in the membrane. And it's at this point you've changed the electrical properties of the cell, which can change the firing rate. So the question is, you, you know, is there an integrator here? And what would it look like depending where it is? So what we're going to do is we're going to model these where each process um, is going to be modeled by, you know, a simple differential equation um, and schematically like so. So the firing rate is going to impact calcium concentration. But at, at each level of these processes, there's also a degradation step. So for example, if activation of CAM kinase 4 via phosphorylation, there'll be a dephosphorylation rate. And what we're looking for is to include, uh, to make an integrator, if we make one of these processes, if we make one of these degradations independent, so for example, if the dephosphorylation of kinase here is independent of the amount of phosphorylated kinase, then what you'd find is that the kinase activity is just integrating this you know calcium activation function um, but we could also have two controllers for example where loss of channels is actually independent of the number of channels and in both these processes the way you get this is through a michaelis menten type scheme where whatever is doing the degradation you require some other molecule which would be an enzyme typically which is saturated so that you know if you need something to go around and remove the channels and that's in short supply. You can have more and more channels, but the removing protein is so busy that you can't remove them at a higher rate, even if you have more channels to remove. That, that, that is the idea of Michaelis menten. Or, or here it's, it's that you bind the enzyme, but the enzyme is nearly all bound to different kinases, so that if you have more kinases, there's no more free enzyme to bind, to bind it and speed up the dephosphorylation. So in just, you know, if we just run through an equation, you know, there's a whole system of them. But we just, these are basically all feed forward. If you see that calcium depends on firing rate, impacts the activation of kinase. The amount of kinase then impacts the translation, um, sorry, transcription of mRNA and the amount of mRNA. And we, we now here have the two different types of mRNA. We separate out the channel proteins for synapses or AMPA receptors and you know, sodium, potassium type channels. And then, depending on the amount of mRNA, it's going to impact the input conductance or the threshold of the cell. Okay? And all of these terms, they have a degradation term. And we're basically going to look and just, just set, set the system so that um, all of these terms are monotonic and will be Hill functions, which I should have shown, but they kind of are zero at zero concentration, but then will saturate. And if any of these are in the saturating regime, then they're essentially independent of the term in brackets. So you can see now, for example, that if the kinase degradation is independent of the amount of kinase, you just have a constant here. Then the rate of change of kinase activity is just, you know, we're just integrating up the um, function of calcium. So then kinase activation would be an integrator if this were constant in kinase. And once you have an integrator, then if things feed back with the correct sign, and we'd need one of these functions to be negatively monotonic instead of positively, then you can have a control system. And Tim O'Leary kind of set up something pretty much the same as this uh, as well. So when we have a dual control system, we're just making the integration step after this branching point. And the branching has to be a transcription. So that by branching, I mean whether feedback for synaptic inputs has been separated from the feedback for the threshold of the cells. And after transcription, you've got different mRNA, which are going to encode different proteins and go to different positions in the cell. Um, and the mRNA might even be moved to different locations after here um, right away. So any type of integrator after here would require two separate ones, one to control the threshold, one to control the synaptic conductance. Alternatively, if the control is before the transcription stage and the Trigiano lab has shown that CAMK4 is involved in both um, synaptic homeostasis and intrinsic homeostasis. And, and they, they do this by, for example, making CAMK4 for, um, constitutionally active or inactive, so it's essentially so it can't respond, and they show that homeostasis is impaired. So we know that this is involved in, fourth, in both types of feedback. If this is the integrator, then you really have one controller. 
So we're going to test the systems, these two types of system. And here again, we'll just be varying the input current and seeing how the system responds in the two cases. So on the left, I'm showing the dual control system. On the right, I'm showing the single control system. So the first thing you can see is if, if we look at the single controller, if we just change the input currents, then it responds pretty quickly in its firing rate to just a shift in input currents. So a single controller is actually better than the dual controller in this because it responds quicker. The dual controller always you know, gets this response, but notice here, even the initial condition, um, it was a very bad one and it takes a long time before it finally comes to its, you know, here, the, the two systems have slightly different goal firing rates and these are kind of set by, you know, very subtle functions of all the um, parameters in this system of equations. Um, but it takes much longer to respond. So here, and this is often because you have two types of feedback that are kind of competing with each other and drifting along some null clients to some extent. Um, so here I think you can see there's zero variation input because this is a case where the um, synaptic input control have pushed the synaptic conductance to zero, basically because the system is firing too high. And it's only eventually after the threshold is now high enough that the neuron stops firing that the synaptic input can go back up again. But it gets there both times. But in particular, when we change the variance of the inputs, the dual control system still responds and gives a decent mean firing rate. You know, so, so the idea is that these long-term responses, the steady states, are pretty stable independent of the inputs. Whereas a single controller is pretty hopeless when you change the variation in the inputs. And you can look at this more if you also want to control the variation of your outputs. Um, the dual controller is pretty much able to do that. You know, it eventually, you know, we've always, always got a steady state with very similar variance and very similar mean. But the single controller ha has no control over the variance of this output. <clears throat> and if, if we like looked into the system to see what is going on, in the dual controller, if you remember, the integration step is right at the end. So that means everything before it is essentially a temporal filter of its inputs. Um, so the kinase activation is always around the same value in the dual controller um, because it depends on the firing rate, which is always returning to the same, you know, same firing rate statistics are going to produce the same statistics in the kinase. The single controller, though, is different because the single controller, the, the amount of kinase is an integration of the error signal. So here, when even when the firing rate goes back to its correct level, you'll see that um, there was an error. You know, it, for a while, the firing rate was too high before it came down. There's this error signal, and the kinase activation is higher in compensation. So when you integrate up the error signal, each time you get these change in input statistics, your steady state is different. So that would be one way of, you know, at the molecular level dissociating them. The other thing to notice, if we just look at the outputs, you know, the, those main parameters we looked at in the beginning, the input conductance and the threshold. Whenever you have a single controller, as, as I mentioned earlier, their outputs are the same control system. Here's the kinase is controlling all these downstream responses. Their changes are always going to be correlated with each other. And if they're each set up to be, you know, stable on their own, um, in this case, every time the conductance goes down, it means that the neuron should fire less, so the threshold goes up. So here we see the conductance going down, the threshold going up, the conductance jumps back up, the threshold goes back down. These are all working in tandem in the same direction. If one is trying to increase the ex excitability, so is the other. If one is trying to decrease the response, so is the other. In the dual consistent system, though, you can get these kind of mutually opposing effects. You know, which was often considered the problem. That was kind of the, the basic problem of wind-up, that they can be opposing each other. But here they're opposing in a way that it will work out to control the variance. So, for example, after this change where the variance went up, the input conductance went down to reduce the var variability, but therefore the threshold had to go down to um, main, help maintain a mean firing rate. And similar here, the threshold goes up at the same time as the input conductance goes up. So here the conductance is trying to make the cell more excitable, whereas the threshold is jumping up to make it less exciting. So they're compensating each other as they you know, essentially help the variance to stay what it should be, keep the right variability in output as well as the mean. So if I finish in summary, so a dual system can be better than a single control system, you know, as long as you 
um, basically ensure there's no instabilities by having the set points um, in the right correspondence, that the synaptic one being higher than that of the intrinsic. Of course, if there are intrinsic currents that really produced um, a more of a gain effect in the response, then this might be different. Um, but anything that's more shifting plus or minus in a response versus multiplicative of the response is the multiplicative one you want to have the highest set point. And also that one then should have a greater second derivative in its feedback signal. And, and we did this, um, all our feedback responses were hill functions and we could just decide where on that hill, on, on the function we put the set point. Um, to look at this, you know, to see if there really is a dual control system, <clears throat> you could either look at different um, biochemical molecules and see which ones are really acting like an integrator of the error, um, which we know the output conductances are, um, and which ones are more like a filter. And if everything before transcription, I should say transcription here is a filter, before there's a branching in the pathways of the output, um, if there are filters, then it's more of a suggestion of a dual control system, that the actual integration step is after that point. And the other thing you might notice is that you could get circumstances, particularly if it's, you know, the, the inputs maintain a mean but change variance, that the two types of response, homeostatic response, could act in opposing manners if there is a dual mechanism, but you wouldn't expect this with a single mechanism. And in particular, you can then also see then biphasic compensation, where one of the conductances in response to a single change could be going up and then back down. So I'll leave you with that summary and say thank you for being patient and listening, and I welcome any questions you have. Thank you very much, Paul. <clears throat> um, I think, first of all, apologies. I had to leave in the middle because the kindergarten oh, called and uh, I had to pick up my daughter, so I busted over to the kindergarten while Chaitanya held the helm. Um, I'm going to invite Chaitanya also on the screen. He posted a question, as well as a dogawa, um, and maybe they can ask their questions. But um, while they're logging on, I think the most immediate question is experimental evidence, right? Um, do you have any? Do you have? I mean, this, I'm assuming this didn't come out of thin air. Maybe I missed it while I was running around. Um, but what is um, what is the experimental I, evidence? The initial this? evidence really is that we do have two types of. I mean, there are multiple types of feedback, right? So, um, the fact that both synapses change. You know, I mean, there's also actually inhibitory synaptic feedback as well. Um, conversation. So the fact that we do get all these different outputs, it really does you know lead to the question. Should you know? Should there really only be one control system? And initially, it, it wasn't looked for because, well, well, I, I think to be fair, the Trigiana lab did look for it, but they were looking at it um, by seeing if you know which molecules impact both control outputs. You know, so if you um, make CAM kinase four constitutionally inactive, does that impact both synaptic homeostasis and firing rate? Um, the threshold response homeose, um, homeostasis. So, th so this is really done to kind of suggest what you'd need to look at to be able to distinguish the two. Um, and there are some things that they do see in their data that over several days you'll see um, certain changes go up and come back down. And they are you, the, the problem is in vivo, there are a lot of other things going on, so it's not conclusive that it's really from this you know, single, because this is really a single cell response. So do you think it's only two feedback? There could be um, three or regulators? four. I mean, the more you have, you know, each time you're consigning yourself to kind of, you know, instead of a quadrant, then there'll be an octant, you have these different requirements of which has a higher threshold, and which has greater nonlinearity, which kind of puts you in a portion of the space of those. So the more you have, the more constraints there'll be for it not to be, you know, to be able to be stable. So it gets harder and harder. You know, so if you have two, there's a quarter of space you can be in and something could work. If you had four, you'd be in a 16th of space where, you know, 16 to one at the time, you just had random fixed points and so on. You would not be able to produce yeah. a stable response. So it will get harder with you, but, but they, they, no. they are pretty sure that inhibitory synapses have a different homeostatic mechanism. Um, 
And there also seem to be, you know, rather than single cell, more mm -hmm. circuit, yeah, maybe local, you know, um, me mechanisms in the, just among many local neurons with responses in the extracellular mm -hmm. media that, that could be infecting cells. May also be that um, may also be that this the, the homeostatic mechanisms are homeostatic for different quantities or qu like different aspects right. of the neural activity, right? Spiking, influx of calcium or whatever that aren't necessarily directly uh, linked but have indirect right. effects. On, and and on one each thing other. we looked at which can improve stability is the idea of I think. Tim calls it bang bang, and I think Tim has much more engineering um, training than me. A bang bang controller, where you have one control, you know, kind of really like heating systems are. We don't always have the thermostat and the cooler just increasing their strength depending how far you are away. They'll just come on when you're too far away from the set point. And so if you have that, you can just have a range that is okay. You know, so neurons, it's not like they have to fire on average two hertz over a day or something. It wouldn't matter if they're three or four, you know, there could be a factor of several fold and and if you look across neurons there's a, a leap more than a tenfold range in their mean firing rates maybe a hundredfold so you could have systems whereas only when you get outside a range you switch on the control mechanism then you'd have a different one for reducing rate as increasing rate so when you have that things yeah. can be you know you can have a lot more stable range where you can get away with some of these issues a little bit more yeah um one of our viewers asked when you showed the graph of the line and the nonlinear right. curve, so the FI curve, I think, as he's talking about, um, uh, close to each other, are there many intersecting points? Um, and wouldn't that necessarily make for lots of unstable fixed points as well? Okay, yeah, if I go um, back to that. Um... Yeah, I can focus the screen for you. So that was this one. Okay. This one, yeah, so, I believe it's that one. So, that, so that this is our cartoon. So, to be honest, when whenever in, these sorts of integrators are being made in any circuit that is heterogeneous, you know, not homogeneous, then you do end up with a whole bunch of close, you know, close fixed points. And then between each stable one, that you're exactly correct, there would be an unstable one. And the the point is, when there are so many fixed points, if you're in the vicinity of one you um any change as a function of time is slow so this is you know someone's considered like the ghost of the attractor that you only need to be able to integrate you know to have kind of not much leak in your integration <coughs> over a time scale for mo most things that are considered in cognition on the order of a second so if you have enough of them close together it can act pretty well like an integrator um in our system it really was you know, one fixed point, you know, the whole group um, would go down slowly to a very low activity or gradually up to a very high activity um, if it was untuned. Um, but in reality, in a more heterogeneous system, you would imagine multiple fixed points. And in, in recurrent neural network models of tasks, um, like the Mante task, um, where they were looking at integrating up a visual flickering stimulus in a context-dependent manner, there, the recurrent neural network that you know, they used to solve the task, it did have many fixed points close together, and the system would act like it was integrating. But if you mathematically strictly, it's not a pure integrator. Yeah. yeah. Um, Paul, Chaitanya came on, on screen to uh, ask you a question. Hi. Oops. Uh, thank you, Paul. There was a super nice talk. I really liked it. Uh, I had a question, but I think you addressed it in the last point that was related to uh, molecular pathways or uh, physical signatures of uh, these feedback mechanisms. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there are any other candidates for these things other than the ones that you mentioned with the camp K4. And the second question is if this sort of homeostatic uh, regulatory mechanisms could be applied to every other cell like every other neuron, for instance. Right, so, so we'd be assuming this sort of feedback is going on in every neuron um, for firing rate. I mean, other cells in the body that don't have, you know, the, the firing rate homeostasis is pretty specific, um, but they all do have feedback mechanisms for so many things. You, you know, you need to have the right concentrations of different ions in the cell, generally. So there's, I think, like iron itself is, 
something that has to be tightly re regulated. Um, so, so in biology, th there's a lot of work in homeostasis, but doing this, I was realizing how firing rate homeostasis is often considered through a similar lens, but is it is unique um, because neurons have to have this variability. Nearly, I, I don't really know of any other homeostatic system where variability is the goal in a decent range, rather than it being, you want a good fix, you know, our body temperature, we want it to be a certain level, we don't want it to be jumping up and down. So, so in, in that sense, I think the, the dual mechanism I was looking at it would be really specific for neurons, but I would expect it to be present in all neurons because you know, that there may be some you know, situations where their inputs are never going to change or they never, you know, rarely need to change their outputs much. Um, so, so you can imagine po in those situations post-development um, that you wouldn't need such a mechanism. But during development, you know, even as cells, you know, Eve Mahler's lab has looked at this, you know, cells growing sometimes tenfold in size, that over that period, you're going to have to be regulating your channels and so on to maintain function. Because um, everything about neurons, you, you know, is depending on their size. You, you know, you need more channels as you get bigger, and so you, you need to you need to have some sort of control over that. Um, so I would expect it to be that there, there are, are for sure going to be other molecules. I mean, the usual way that it's looked like. I mean, each experiment takes a long time, right? So they you need a sp specific and um, genetic um, organism that might have a, this particular protein constitutionally active, so it's always active or always inactive, and see does that then impact this long experiment. So others, so all they can be sure of are certain ones that are key in the system, but it's hard to rule out others. And as you probably, if you know, you know some cell biology, you very rarely get these nice linear um, pathways, right? Everything is connecting, you know, I'm not, I shouldn't say everything, but there's always lots of other proteins involved that can impact it or regulate it in some way. So I imagine there's a lot of other things that in, in So, that uh, so the, the continuation of that is, uh, if there would be, I mean, I understand that theoretically this makes sense to have these two controllers which are doing this. And given that, uh, the numerosity, the number of neurons and the circumstances like you pointed that the inputs and the output variability depends on the neuron type is so dramatically different for each different neuron to have this one one solution fixes all kind of a thing m may not be the best solution out there, right? Like as in like just looking at camp K4 or whatever. Like Right. So I should say, so this is one mechanism but yes. depending on parameters in the mechanism, which could easily be controlled by other mm -hmm. regular proteins, the fixed points can be almost anywhere. So we could just tweak parameters and set up cells, you know, that the mean firing rate should be 100 hertz instead of zero hertz. And it's all based on, you know, these rates of degradation and, I see. and, and so on. So, so there'll be all the proteins, and degradation involves other proteins. So the, the cells could be totally controlling particular enzymes that are setting these targets yeah. and, and then you can have different activity profiles and so I, yeah, so so you, I, I totally agree you know, you know, not all cells are actually cyber so the, the time scales uh, in in the things that you just showed are in the time scale uh, the time scales of uh, replenishment of the ion channels or increasing ion channels is a time scale of the monocular deprivation so it's a time course of few hours or is it can it be even quicker so, so this is actually a big issue in the field of homeostasis, and I've just blanked from all from Gerson's group. There is, was it Sprenic? Someone did some great work showing you need, you know, basically you need some, a fast time scale in, because heavy in plasticity is very fast. So if you actually want to compensate for that, you need homeostatic responses to actually be fast. So this is a particularly slow one. So it might be that this one is really more important during development when you know neurons growing a full size over many many days and weeks and um, versus stabilizing heavy in plasticity um, one idea i like there is um, heteroplasticity. plasticity that when you potentiate a synapse and vaginov in um, ucsd i think has done a lot of work on this and um, if you potentiate one synapse and there's reasons for this you might get a bit of overflow to neighboring synapses which will actually cause depression 
So if you just take the idea that high local calcium will give you potentiation, but a weak raising, slower raising calcium will give depression, when you potentiate one synapse, nearby ones can be depressed. And there's some experiment evidence for that. And, th and that is homeostatic, right? So it's going to stop you and over potentiating all the synapses. Yeah, so thank but you. Really, it does certainly seem we need something that does seem need to, that does need to be something faster than this many hours or days. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I just added the paper that you spoke about, about the fast rate detector by Friedemann Senke Thank and you, Wilhelm sorry. Gerstner. <coughs> no problem. I'm sorry um, if you're in the audience yeah. as well. <laughs> we can check. I'll check later. <laughs> um, Paul, I think that's it for questions. Okay. Uh, and we're well, pretty much okay. on the spot. Um, so I'd say thank you very much for uh, your lecture and uh, maybe see you soon again. Yeah, hope to see you in person soon whenever. <laughs> and until you. then, I'll take Have a little visit after. Wow. <laughs> All right. Right. Tasking as a parent, tough days. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> see thank you. you so much for inviting me and thank you everyone for listening. It's been lovely. I'll go now and watch it on YouTube and look at the part that... Uh, that is missing for me as okay. I ran out in the middle. So see you soon. Okay. Bye then. Bye.